What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. Take it. It's yours. It always was. Friendos, welcome to another stream. I was going to wait till later today, but I have apparently severe conflicts with keeping a regular schedule, so here we are. Today, my friends, we are going to continue on with the uh, Scarlet Gospels here. And some quick announcements. If you haven't seen already in chat, I have a Discord server up 
some people like Discord, so I thought, eh, put a, put a server up and see if uh, people are into it. Um, other announcements. I am that D4NT3 on the internet, on Twitter, on Twitch, on Mixer, blah, 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 blah. And I think that's about it for now. So let's get right into it. When we last left our intrepid heroes, um, our friend, uh, the detective, Harry Demore, and his pals had just crossed the threshold into hell to follow the hell priest, who we all know as Pinhead, but he's actually the hell priest. And uh, they had just stepped through when we last read, and I just could not wait to see what happened next. So here we are. Extra Gamer 292, what's up? Gonna do some reading today. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. Harry and his and his band of roving crazy people have just crossed the threshold from Earth into Hell, and they are about to go chasing after a pinhead or the Hell Priest. So here we go. From the first, Hell surprised them. Even Harry, who had caught a fleeting glimpse of its geography in Louisiana. They stepped out to the other side of the place of passage into a far from unpleasant site. A grove in a forest of antediluvian trees. Their branches so weighed down with age that a small child could have picked a large dark purple skinned fruit simply by reaching up. However, none such child had been on duty to harvest the fruits and as a result they littered the ground. The sickly stink of their corruption, only one part of the stew of smells that had added its own particular horror to the oppressive stench that had stopped Harry in his tracks as he had passed from earth into hell. God damn, Lana said. Oh, it's a girl. Dope. I thought the roaches in my apartments were big. She was looking down at the brown black insects that appeared to have a close familiar relation to the common cockroach. The main difference being that they were perhaps six times larger. They covered the ground at the base of the trees, devouring the food that had fallen there. The sound of their brittle bodies rubbing against one another and of their busy mouth parts devouring the fruit filled the grove. Anybody see Pinhead? Harry said. Is that his name? Lana said. Pinhead? It's a name I know he hates. I can see why, Dale said, chuckling to himself. It's not a very kind nickname. Or even accurate for that matter. Is he some kind of big noise in hell? Kaz asked. I don't know, Harry said. I'm sure he thinks so. I just want to get Norma back and fuck out of here. That's a good plan in theory, but the execution might prove a bit more difficult, said Kaz, gesturing toward the door through which they'd come, or rather, toward the place where it had once stood. The door was no longer there. I'm sure we'll find a way out, Harry said. It's easy enough to get in. We should all... Back off, you little freak, Lana shrieked, interrupting Harry's suggestion. It didn't take long to figure out why. Dale was wiping blood from the knife Kaz had given him. Without warning, he had stuck a knife into the meat of Lana's palm. It was a nasty wound. When, caught, when Kaz caught hold of Lana, whose face was already gray and clammy, he persuaded her to raise her hand and keep it raised so the blood could drain. The blood coursed down her arms, soaking her blouse in the process. What the fuck, Lana blurted. I'll kill you. Kaz maintained his hold on her. Dale cracked a mischievous spot, smile. Harry moved between them as a buffer and faced Dale, closing his hand around the hilt of his knife once more. Mind explaining what the fuck that was, Dale? Harry asked. He's fucked. What else do you need to know? Dreadfully sorry. Really, I am. It simply needed to be done. The dreams told me. I recognized the moment and got swept up in it. I think your friend might be disturbed, Harold, said Kaz gonna be sick, Lana said. No, you're not, Cass told her. Don't look at your hand. Look at me. He shrugged off his battered leather vest and pulled off his black t-shirt, tearing it up into bandage width strips. I'll have all this out of sight in just a few seconds, he promised Lana. You're going to be fine. This fucking sucks. That's the hand I use for, uh, you know. Cass smiled, doing his best to get the wound bound tightly enough to stop the flow of blood. Harry, meanwhile, watched Dale closely, who was trying his best to apologize, but his supplication fell on deaf ears. None of Harry's alarms were sounding when he pointed them toward the diminutive man, but then again he was smack dab in the middle of what no longer fabled land where villains were supposedly dealt their karmic justice, and, as a result, 
his tattoos were behaving erratically. Harry went with good old-fashioned intuition and separated Dale from the group. You're on probation, Harry said. Out in front. Any other tricks, and I'll let Lana have her way with you. Can't I now? Lana said. Just wait, Dale said. You'll see. The dreams are never wrong. I found you, didn't I, Harry? There was silence for several seconds, and at least among the two-legged occupants of the grove. The roaches continued their seething sibilant song among the decaying fruits. What's up, Yoda Fonzie? Finally, Harry spoke, ignoring Dale's question. Uh, just a quick uh, summary, Yoda. Um, we are on chapter 10 of the Scarlet Gospels, and the crew, if you're not familiar with the story, uh, the crew has just followed Pinhead slash the Hell Priest into, into Hell. So they're in Hell now looking for the Hell Priest. Let's prioritize here. At the risk of stating the obvious, this isn't going to be easy. We need to find Norma as fast as we can. Avoid the powerful demon that wants me as his slave. And well, who's saying this? And then get the fuck out of hell. I'm sure we'll encounter some heinous, unthinkable, soul-scarring shit along the way. But hopefully we all make it out alive. His friends, sell, his friends fell silent. Lana gripped the tender flesh of her wounded hand close to her chest and snorted. Good pep talk, coach. I feel much better now. Norma had been sitting Norma had been sitting what she judged to be many hours now in a darkness within a darkness. For the first time in her life she saw nothing at all. Her blindness oppressed her. She longed to be cured of it, to be able to see something of the demon and his human underling, the one with the breath of a man who had an ulcerous stomach. Though the world as sighted people saw it, it was a closed book to her. She saw what they could not, the presence of phantoms everywhere, their faces ripe with need and unspent passion trailing their hunger like pollen from flowers that were past their hour but refused to wither and disappear. These sights had been, until now, more than adequate compensation for whatever spectacles she'd been denied. She had envied the sighted masses who walked the streets below her apartment, nothing as long as she had her ghosts. But there were no ghosts here. She heard the dusty whispering that she knew was a sign of their presence, but no matter how loudly she called out to them, no matter how hard she willed them to appear, they would not come. You are alone, the Cenobite said. She flinched. She had not heard him come in. It made her uneasy. Usually she knew in her bones when something, anything was nearby. But the demon was quiet. Too quiet. And he stank. God almighty, he stank. Her sensitivity to the nuances of smell was another gift of her sightlessness and this creature stank to high heaven. This was a being who trafficked, of course, with demons. Their countless varieties of bitterness were all over him. So too was blood, as of the overpowering scent of a butcher's apron. Whiffs of it came off whatever instruments of hurt hung from his waist. But the strongest scent was the oldest. It was the perfume of his transgressions. There were other smells too, some of which she could name. Incense, books, sweat, and far, far more that she had no name for. He had spoken to her scarcely at all, except to remind, as if she did not already know, that he was an expert in the provision in, in the provision of suffering, and that if she did anything to irritate him, she would instantly have first-hand knowledge of his expertise. Only when her nerve endings and her sanity had given up, and only then, he had said, would she be granted an undignified death, so she had not moved. She'd stayed in the darkness within the darkness and done her best to reach out past the horrors to some, to some comforting memory. The face of a happy revenant, one whom she'd directed to the place where his loved ones would be, or the fine, happy times she'd had with Harry and a bottle of brandy, reminiscing about some shared craziness. But for some reason, the memories gave her no pleasure now. There was a stone in her stomach and it weighed her down, stopping her from flying off into the past. She was therefore glad, in point of fact, that the demon had finally condescended to come back into her presence, even with his bitter sense invading her senses. In that, she was at least saved from boredom. The detective and his bands of misfits will surely have come for you, he said. I will keep you alive. Despite your friend's protestations, he has already begun his work as my witness. Then, without warning, he hit her in the stomach. The blow bent her double. There she stayed, gasping for air. 
Before she could catch her breath, he went at her face with a left, then a right, then another left, each blow a loud, stupefying sound in her head. There was a moment's hiatus, and then he came back at her, physically unbending her by seizing hold of her shoulders and lifting her up as he threw her against the wall. Again the breath went from her, her and her legs, which were going increasingly numb, threatening to fold up beneath her. No, he said as she began to slide. You stay standing. He put his right hand around her throat to hold her head up and with his left proceeded to strike her again and again, delivering hammering blows to her liver, her heart, her kidneys, to her breasts, to her gut, to her sex, and up to her heart again, twice, three times, and down through the same already tender, aching places. It was pleasure he was feeling, she was certain. Even now, as she barely held on to, con to consciousness, some part of her that could never relinquish the study of body language heard the little exhalations of contentment emerge from the demon when he stood back for a moment and reveled in the tears and anguish on her bloodied and swollen face. She felt his stare like a subtle pressure upon her, and knowing that he was finding joy in her suffering, she pulled together every thread of strength in her soul and she brought those tears up behind her face to deny him the satisfaction. She knew it would piss him off and that knowledge only strengthened her. She closed her mouth and coaxed the threads of strength into turning up the corners of her lips into a geoconda smile. Her eyes, she also closed, slow, slowly lowering her lids to conceal from him her frailty. There would be no more tears now, nor shouts of pain. The threads had sewn the expression in place. It was a mosque. Whatever she truly felt was hidden behind it, unreachable. He released the clamp of his hand from her neck and she slid down the wall, her legs folding up beneath her. He pressed his booted foot, foot he pressed his booted foot against her shoulder and she toppled over, toppled over. After that, he delivered one vicious kick to her body, cracking several ribs and another to her throat which really tested the strength of her mask. It held, however. Knowing what was coming next, she tried to bring her hand up to her face to protect it but she wasn't fast enough. His boot got there first, one straight kick to the face, blood bursting from her nose, another kick at her face, and now, finally, she felt the darkness within a darkness wrapping her in its blanket of nullity, and she was grateful for its imminence. The demon raised his foot and brought the boot down hard on the side of her head. It was the last thing she felt. Oh, Christ, she thought. I can't be dead. I've, I've so much left unfinished. Funny, she didn't feel dead, but then... Wasn't that the most common thing she heard from her visitors? And if she wasn't dead, why could she see her? Why could she see her see for the first time? And why was she hovering nine or ten feet above the place where her body lay against the wall? The demon, what did Harry call him? Dick face, pinprick, pinhead. That was it. He was backing away from her. His breath, his breathing ragged. It had taken no little effort for the Cenobite to brutalize her the way he had. And having stepped away, he changed his mind and approached her again, kicking her hands away from her face. He'd made a real mess of her, no doubt about that. But she was very pleased to see that her enigmatic smile was still in place, defying him. There was a sliver of satisfaction in that, no question, however hard the rest of the news was to take. Aside from the obvious, she found it impossible to think of the demon as a pinhead. That was a schoolyard insult, or the name of a pitiful sideshow freak. It did not belong to the, the monster standing over her body now, his body shaking with excitement from the beating he had just delivered. The demon retreated a few more steps, still looking at what his brutality had achieved, and then reluctantly withdrew his gaze and turned his attention to the little weasel of a man who had just entered the room and was lingering by the door. She knew without need to hear his voice that this was the creature who'd first caught a hold of her on the street back in New York whispering all manner of obscene threats into her ear to keep her from resisting his hold on her. He was more pitiful to look at than she'd imagined. A wizened gray thing, throwing peasant rags over his naked body, and yet on his face, even now after what he'd done to her by hauling her here, she saw the remains of what had surely once been a man possessed of luminous intelligence. He had laughed much once and pondered deeply too, to judge from the lines left by old laughter on his cheeks and frown marks on his brow. As she studied him, she felt herself plucked away from the room where her beaten body lay. Some invisible tether was pulling her through this building, which was a maze of once beautiful rooms. Grand halls were plaster rotted and fell away from the walls. 
and the mirrors decayed. Where was I? Oh, their gold leaf frames flaking and crusting over. Here and there, as she made her unintentional departure, she caught sight of the remains of places where others, prisoners of circumstance like herself, had been tortured. The remains of one such victim lay with his legs in the furnace, where a fierce fire had once burned, consuming his, consuming his extremities somewhere above the knee. The victim had died long ago, his flesh long since petrified leaving behind something that resembled a bronze diorama that paid tribute to a murder scene. She saw the victim's ghost, too. Hanging in the air forever. Hey, thanks for the follow, Kion TV. She saw the victim's ghost, too, hanging in the air, forever tethered to his agonized remains. The sight of him gave her comfort. She didn't understand this seemingly abandoned place, but she would be able to learn from its ghosts. They knew a lot of the dead. How many times had she said to Harry they were the world's greatest untapped resource? It was true. All they'd seen. All they'd suffered. All they'd triumphed over. Lost to a world in need of wisdom. And why? Because at a certain point in the evolution of the species, a profound superstition was sown into the human heart that the dead were to be considered sources of terror rather than enlightenment. Angelic work, she guessed. Some spiritual army instructed by one commander or another to keep the human population in a state of passive stupefaction or st yeah, stupefaction interesting word while the war raged on behind the curtain of reality the order had been carried out and instead of being allowed to comfort humanity's collective soul the dead became the source of countless tales of terror while the phantoms that were their spirits made manifest found themselves shunned and abom abominated until over the generations mankind simply taught itself a willful blindness Norma knew what a loss there was in this. Her own life had been immeasurably enriched by the dead. Much of the human rage and appetite for war and its atrocities might have been soothed away by the certain knowledge that the three score, ye three score years and ten of our biblical span were not the, sum, the full sum of things, rather a thumbnail sketch for a glorious, limitless work. But this knowledge would not come to light in her lifetime. Norma had only ever shared her thoughts on this with one living person, Harry. But she had listened countless times to ghosts unburdening themselves of their anguish at being unseen, unable to comfort their loved ones by simply saying, I'm here, I'm right beside you. Death, she had come to realize, was a two-sided mirror of griefs, that of the blind living who believed, that they, who believed they'd lost their loved ones forever, the other of the sighted dead who suffered beside their loved ones but could not offer a syllable of comfort. Her reverie was broken as she passed through the roof of the building and, and the light of hell washed over her. She had assumed that at some point her sight would desert her, but it did not. As the building fell away beneath her, she was granted a bird's eye view of the wilderness through which the Cenobite and Felixen had brought her. She hadn't really expected infernal regions to resemble anything that the great poets and painters and storytellers evoked throughout the millennia but she was still astonished that they had fallen so far short of what her spirit's eyes now saw. The sky contained neither sun nor stars, which was predictable enough, but what it did contain was a stone the size of a small planet. The stone reached high above the immense landscape that spread out below, and it threw off fissures like lightning bolts, through which brightness poured. The effect upon the vast panorama was uncanny. This was scarcely a promising environment, but still it found a way to grow, even prosper. On the slopes of the hills beneath her, long white grass swayed in some infernal wind, and here and there brushes grew. The branches barbed and knuckled but bearing small colorless, colorless flowers. Her mind began to run wild once again. Where was this journey taking her? Did it even have a destination? Or was she simply loosed from her body and fated to wander hell for eternity? Regardless of her will or intent, the invisible tether continued to pull her toward its unknown purpose. And as it did, her spirit began to sink toward the ground. Excuse me. In a few seconds, she was moving inches above the level of the white grass. Some distance ahead of her was a small forest. The canopy, the canopy of upper branches was intricately knotted, except for perhaps 30 or 40 wild ones that had freed themselves and grew like sticks of black lightning. Large black birds were perched on several of the knotted branches, fighting with the beaks and claws, fighting with beaks and claws for the choicest spots. She was so distracted by the sight of their feuding that she didn't notice 
the people emerging from the darkness beneath the trees until she was almost upon them. Then she smelled blood, and everything went white. Dale, forced at the front by Harry, had been leading the way, but now, as they had barely stepped foot out of the forest, he turned and stared at his followers. It's close, Dale said. Keep walking, dickhead, Lana said. Harry, your friend's being weird again, said Kaz. We talked about this, Dale, said Harry. No, 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 said Dale in full southern charm mode. Oh, he's got a southern accent. He has a southern accent. Let's try this. It's about to happen. You'll all be very happy, I promise. And then when it's over, dearest Lana, I do hope you'll think better of me. You're freaking, you're fucking creepy, man, Lana said. All I know is I'd feel a whole lot better if I'm... She stopped abruptly, changing her tone from irritation to bewilderment. What? She said, her voice hushed as she lifted her injured hand to her face and examined the injury as though seeing it for the first time. Fresh blood was running from underneath the bandages. I'll be damned, she said in the same soft voice. Harry? I'm right here, Luna. Lana. Luna. <laughs> no. I think I'm dead, she said softly, followed immediately by commanding. Get out! Who the fuck? I will not get out! Don't fight it, Lana, Dale said. It's your blood. It's how she found us. Fight what? Harry said, approaching Dale, his tone serious. What did you do? Whoa, Kaz said, tightening his grip on one of his knives. Is this like a demonic possession thing? I'll kill the little dude right now if I have to. Shit's bad enough as it is. Everyone shut up! It's me, Norma, said Norma, from somewhere within Lana. Who said you could hijack me? Lana protested. Norma? Harry said, turning to Lana, his eyes narrowing in disbelief. Yes, it's me, I don't know. The words ceased as Lana shook her head again, determined to d dislodge her unwelcome guest. What the fuck is happening here? Lana, let Norma speak, Harry said. Fuck off, Lana snapped. I've been possessed before. It's not a feeling I like. She won't stay long, honey, Dale said. I promise. Just let her say what she needs to say, said Harry. This is why we're here. Okay, Lana said, nodding as she drew a deep breath. Just let me catch my bearings. I've never had a friendly ghost inside me. You've never had anything friendly inside you, Kaz said. I'll remember that the next time you're drunk and you can't find a man. Cass pursed his lips. Oh, I'm sure there's always a willing man for you, Dale. Oh, Dale said. Dale said. Dale said. Eyeing Kaz a smile on his mischievous face. Kaz, caught off guard, looked at Dale, flushed. Okay, Lana continued. I'm ready. Let's get it over with so we can get out of this shithole and go back to the shithole I'm more familiar with. She closed her eyes and let out a deep, deep breath. Then, my goodness. Norma, said Harry. That really you? Afraid so, Harry. Oh, Lord, I think I might be dead. That bastard just finished beating the living shit out of me. Pinhead? Hands on? Hands, feet? Last time I saw him, he was stomping on my head. I'm going to fucking kill him. It's a lovely thought, Harry. Thank you, but it's not going to be easy. He's not your ordinary, he's not your ordinary sadomasochist from beyond the grave. Oh, dear, I think it's time to go already. Lana, let her stay. It's not Lana. It would appear I'm not dead after all. My body's wandering. Where the, wondering where the hell my mind went. Do you know where your body is? Yeah, some big-ass building straight down this road. Looks like it was really fancy back in the day, but it's falling apart now. Listen to me, Harry. You all got to get out of here. I don't want anyone dying on my account. No one's dying, and we're not leaving without you. Oh, for Christ's sake, Harry. Listen to me. He's too strong. Whatever you think you've got up your sleeve, it's not going to be enough. I'm not going to leave you down here, Norma. Whatever happens, I'm going to... Lana's eyes opened, and there was a brief, brief flash of confusion on her face. Then it cleared, and Lana said, Is that it? Harry sighed. That's it. Thank you, Lana. You were great. No problem, she said, flooding her eyes. Just as long as she didn't doesn't plan on being a permanent tenant. She doesn't. Is she dead? Because that's what freaks me out, having a dead person in here with me. She's alive, Harry said, for now. Oh, and Dale? Lana said. Hmm? Dale said. Next time, tell me what the fuck you need before you do it. You cut me again without me approving, even for a good reason like that one. I'll rip your cock off. Norma woke in to a place of pain. In her head, her stomach, her back, her legs, she could feel every blow.
get her to her feet, Felixson. And hurry. We have business in the city. It's time to put an end to this ridiculous regime. Better sooner, while they're still arguing among themselves. Get her up. And if she won't walk, then carry her. But Master, would it not be better to simply kill her? Felixson said. The priest stopped his preparations and fixed his icy gaze on Felixson. Without uttering another word, Felixson bowed his head in apology repeatedly and approached the still bloodied and bruised Norma, then leaned in close to her face and uttered a quiet monologue. Norma got a whiff of Felixson's foul breath, which only added insult to her copious injuries. I know you're listening to me, you black cunt. I know, I don't know what he wants from you, but I don't intend to carry you all the way to the city. So I'm going to make life a little easier for both of us. I can't heal you. I don't have that much power. But I can give you an epioidic opiate. It will put the pain out of sight and mind for a while. Will it take my wits? Norma murmured through the blood in her mouth. What do you care? Take what you're given and be grateful. He glanced away for a moment just to confirm that he and his ep epioidia weren't being witnessed. They weren't. The priest had once again begun his preparation, an incantation of some sort, when Felixson began muttering an incantation of his own under his breath. He was good. She had to give him that. She felt the, op the opioid of date. Wow, how is that pronounced? Opiate. Opiate. Spreading through her body, its warmth removing all traces of pain. That should do it, he said. Oh my Jesus, yes. Just remember to moan and sob every now and... Oh, that's him. Just remember to moan and sob every now and then... You're supposed to be in pain, remember? Don't worry, I'll give him a good show. Get up! Felix and Ben said loudly, grabbing Norma's arm and pulling her to her feet. Norma let out a ragged series of cries and curses, but the fact was the incantation was so strong that it had even taken away problems not caused by the demon. Arthritis, stiffness, the general pain created from the business of being all gone. She felt better than she had in years. So what if the epoidia was only covering up the problem? She would happily live in this opiated state as long as she could. Next time, she had a moment alone with him. She tried to get him to teach her that trick she, he'd use so she could give herself another fix when this one wore off. Then her thoughts turned to Harry and his gang of harrowers. Norma didn't like the idea of any of them, friends or not, traveling to this wretched place for her sake. But she knew that Harry wouldn't take her advice, and she couldn't blame him. Were the roles reversed, she'd ignore his request, just as he, no doubt, was ignoring hers. What are you thinking, woman? Oh, the, the Cenobite. What are you thinking, woman? The question came from the Cenobite. Just <coughs> nursing my wounds. Why nurse wounds you cannot feel? I don't... I detest unconvincing lies. I know what he did, the priest said, pointing a gnarled finger at Felixen. Never think either of you, that I am not with you, even when you are not within eyesight. No, Lord, Felix said. Felixen said, his voice thinned with fear. You disappoint me, Felixen, and you, the Cenobite said to Norma, you can stop that wretched hobbling. We have a long journey ahead. A plague fog now waits for us a quarter of a mile from the city's limits. It will ensure that the damned are off the streets and in their homes, if homes they have. Norma felt the demon's scrutiny abandon in her. And as he turned away, Felixson pushed past her. God damn you, he whispered to her. Get behind me and grab a hold of my shoulder. If we get separated, I won't wait for you. I'll be sure to hold on then, Norma said. God, I fucking hate the country, Lana said. She glanced around in disgust at the landscape. A hill lined with the trees and shrubs, all black in color. The grass where it grew at all was white, and the dirt it grew in blacker even than it and the dirt it grew in blacker even than the knotted branches of the trees. Harry suddenly stopped and stood alert, his ears pricked. The group fell silent, everyone listening for the sound of whatever it was that Harry seemed to hear. Are those screams? Kaz said. We are in hell, Lana remarked. Holding a hand up to silence his fellow infernal travelers, Harry climbed up to the top of the nearby slope. When he got to the top, he balked at the sight on the horizon. Jesus, he muttered. That's big. 
What you got there, Lana said, climbing up to join him. Whoa, is that fog? Dale said, finishing Lana's question. For her in hell? It's moving, Kaz said, his head barely cresting the slope before the sight stopped him in his tracks, and fast. Where is it going? Lana asked. Nowhere. Look. The city shrouded in fog as it was looked vast, its buildings significantly more elegant and grandiose than Harry had expected. With its pale stone domes and its pl pillared plazas, this was clearly Hell's Rome. The city had been built on many hills, nearly two-thirds of which rose gently, displaying tier upon tier of immaculate buildings. Trees had been carefully positioned to set their knotted darkness off from the polished beauty of the buildings around which they grew. These trees were dwarfed, however, by the, even the humblest of buildings on the slope. The city's architect had been a visionary, no doubt of that. There was nothing in Rome, nothing in any of the greatest cities in the world, that could hope to compare with the glories that had been brought into being here. Some had the simple authority of size. <coughs> Excuse me. Buildings fifty stories tall, the facades of which were not disfigured by so much as a single window. There were statues, too their heads and shoulders easily clearing even the tallest buildings. Whereas the statues of Rome were finely and faithfully crafted likenesses of Christian icons and men who ruled the city, the statues here were puzzles. Some were only vaguely recognizable as humanoid. Others seemed to freeze in the blur of motion, a stone photograph of an unknown being caught in the throes of ecstasy or agony or both and everywhere the laws of physics were casually defied. An immense building was held a hundred feet in the air or more by the two steep rows of steps at the front and the back. A trio of pyramids, their squares intricately inscribed, were built so as to seem caught by a seismic jolt that had thrown two of them into the air and left the third supporting them by only the slenderest of means, corner to corner, edge to edge. And nestled amid it all was a greenish fog that sat unmoving in the expanse of shantytown in a trench directly in front of the city the fog cast its greenish hue onto a band of buildings from the monolithic structures close to the summit down to the high walls that marked the limits of the city proper as it sat willfully motionless over a portion of the mass of tents and crude shacks and animals that form the chaotic fringe around the city limits it was this place this vast shantytown that was the source of the screams this bizarre fog had seemingly settled upon this place, and it was apparent that those who had failed to find their out of its haze were in terrible agony. Who's got the best eyes? Harry said. It's not me. I can see people moving down there, but they're a blur. They're better staying that way, said Kaz. What's happening? They're fucking insane or something, said Lana. They're running around, Kaz shook his head, beating their heads against the walls. And, oh God, there's a guy. Oh Jesus Christ. Are they human? Some of them, Dale said. Most look like demons to me. Yeah, Lana said. And human beings can't make noises like that. It was true. The cacophony, which continued to grow louder, was a sickening din. A befouling stew of noise that was beyond the capabilities of the human lungs and throat. The near-death shrieks were mingled with the noises that sounded like an engine or machine in the final phase of self-destruction. Gears shredding and motors shrieking as they tore themselves apart. This is more like it, Harry said. Hell was starting to disappoint me. Don't put that out there, man, Kaz said. We don't need any more bad vibes than we've already got. Or, I don't know, maybe you do. He looked at Harry, who was squinting to try to get a clearer view of what was happening. You can't wait to get down there, can you? I want this over with, Kaz. You sure that's all? What else could there be, Harry said, keeping his eyes trained on the spectacle. Stop looking at the atrocities for two fucking seconds, Harold. This is me, Kaz. You know that I'm following you all the way down into this mess no matter what, right? I'm here to get Norma, together, and I ain't leaving without her. But I need you to look me in the fucking eyes right now and tell me the truth. And don't do it for me. Do it for you. Harry turned to face his friend and uttered a single defiant, What? Are you enjoying this? Kaz asked. Harry's face fell. After a moment, he opened his mouth to speak. That's when Lana shouted, I can't take it! Kaz and Harry turned to see Lana drop down onto the ground, her arms crossed over the top of her head as though to forcibly hold in her sanity. Kaz went on his haunches beside her. It's okay, Kaz. We'll be, we'll be okay. How can you say that? Look at them. 
Look what this place is doing to them. They live here. We don't stand a chance. Harry sat down in the long white grass a yard from them, tuning out Kaz's placating condolences as he turned his attention once more to the chaos within the pit. Harry knew nothing of the poor creatures whose screams rose heavenward and more than likely fell on deaf ears. Perhaps they deserved the agonies that had been set upon them, perhaps not. Either way, their supplications brought him into an unwelcome headspace, and they mingled with the rest of the assaults on his senses. The penetrating stench of sulfur mixed with burning flesh, the tattoos be beating a wild refrain on his body in a way that brought him once more to that never distant enough night. He could hear the demon's voice in his head, even now, a world away. Spit. Harry heard the word tearing at the inside of his skull. How he wished he could have done something differently that night. If he had, then maybe he'd be able to shake the feeling that he was now exactly where he belonged, where he'd always belonged, in hell. What you thinking about? Dale's voice cut through his thoughts like a knife. His words were an anchor wrapped in innocence. I'm trying to work out how we fit together, Harry said. Why we're here, Dale laughed. You don't have the first idea, do you? No, do you? Ah, that's the big question, isn't it? You already know. I sure do. Care to let me in on the secret? Easy. Watching isn't the same as seeing, Harry laughed. What the hell does that mean? I heard it in a dream. Apparently, Dale assumed the conversation had reached its end here because without uttering another word, he kissed Harry on the top of his head and sauntered away. Kaz, meanwhile, had somewhat, somehow coaxed Lana to her feet and was keeping the city at her back. I don't want to go down there, she sobbed, and none of you can make me. We wouldn't want to, Kaz replied. There was a raw chorus of birds overhead. Harry looked up to see that the noise was coming from the longer of two species of winged creature that were circling above the city. They had congregated with remarkable speed, attracted either by the promising din of agonies from the streets or by the smell, which only now became apparent. The aroma was complicated. There was the twinge of blood in it, but also the fragrance of old incense, and another smell that was impossible to fix, and for that reason far more tantalizing than the others. As he sat on the summit, his thoughts still stirred up by the exchange of enigmas, it could scarcely have been called a conversation. He just had, with a potentially crazy southerner, Harry took in the mingled glories and grotesqueries of hell. He wasn't any less exhausted than he'd been when he left his apartment in New York. He wasn't any less in need of a tenure vacation in Hawaii. Just him, a hut, and a fishing pole. But if he was going to get there, then he was going to have to finish this first. Okay, he said. Let's do this. Being in the fog had very little impression on Norma. The hell priest had done as she had asked him and whatever protection he was using to seal himself off from the fog's effects, he had extended to her. She heard, all too clearly, however, the ghastly noises behind her made by those who had been subjected to the fog's influence. Some were simple grunts made by creatures in pain. <coughs> Others begged more articulately for help. But most pitiful of all were those who, upon seeing the hell priest's imposing figure emerge from the muck, requested with as much civility as they could muster that he please put them out of their misery. Suddenly, Felixson began to shout. Norma, who had clutched at his garments, felt the fabrics torn from her hands. Oh, God in heaven, no! He shrieked. I can smell the fog. It's getting in my eyes. My mouth. Lord, master, help me! Norma stopped dead in her tracks. Hello? What happened? I thought Felixson was protected. He was, the demon said, near to Norma's ear. She jumped at the sound of his voice. But I've stopped. What? Why? His story's at its end. His service to me is complete. I have in you all that I need. You can't. I beg your mercy on his behalf. You do not want to assume such a debt. He eased my pain. Because he did not wish to carry you. I know. I know you even then. And he was doing it, but still he did it. Very well. All he need do is ask. Do you hear, Felixen? Ask, and you shall receive. There was an answering sound from the magician, but it did not resemble, it did not resemble any words known to Norma. Norma reeled in the direction of Felixen's gasps. Speak, she said. Felix, Felixen, listen to me. 
Your lord called your name. Answer him. That's all you have to do. She took a step in the man's direction, her arms extended. The tip of her right shoe came in contact with him first. Can you hear me? She begged, bending forward and searching for the magician. A gaseous grunt was all she received by way of reply. Felix, and speak the words. She heard pitiful sounds indicating his final attempts. Then she heard nothing. Felixen? Oh, Felixen, she whispered into the darkness. You know what? My voice is not creepy enough. Let me give it a little more creepy. Let's see if that does it. Creepy. Creepy. Cre there we go, a little more creepy. There we go. Okay. Felixen, she whispered in the darkness. He can't hear you, the priest said. Oh, Lord in heaven, Norma muttered. Her fingers not yet believing what her mind was still only realizing. Continue their search for Felixen's body. She had taken a knee when her fingers made contact with something hot and sticky. Instantly, she pulled her hand back, her mind's eye already painting an unwelcome picture of flesh ravaged by the carnivorous fog. I don't understand, she said. This man was loyal to you. What have I to gain by feeling anything? Isn't there anything you care about? All is death, woman. All is pain. Love breeds loss. Isolation breeds resentment. No matter which way we turn, we are beaten. Our only true inheritance is death, and our only legacy, dust. So saying, he turned and walked on, leaving the dead man behind. Norma said a short prayer for Felixen and quickly followed after the Cenobite for fear that if she faltered, he would decide she too was no longer worthy protecting, worth protecting. Despite her age and sightlessness, it was difficult for Norma to keep up. Whatever protection working had been thrown over her, it seemed to... What? Whatever protection working had been thrown over her, it seemed to lend her body strength, and she followed in the demon's wake without undue effort. It was called the Bastion of Tyath now, though it had gone by many names before that, each one chosen by the newest ruling despot. But however the interior of the Bastion changed to suit the metaphysical or potential ambition of its occupants, the exterior remained unaltered. It was an uncompromising tower of stone, the blocks of which had been so precisely measured and chiseled that it was virtually impossible, unless you had your face to the Bastion wall, to discover where one stone ended and another began. Many legends had accrued around it, chiefly regarding its creation, the most popular and probably the likeliest this, that it had been the first building raised in the vicinity, its commissioner, architect, and soul mason, an Uyghur demon called Hothak, who had built it to protect his human wife, a woman called Jacqueline, who was pregnant with a quintet of hybrids, the first fruit of the mating between the sublime angelic, fallen or not, and the ridiculous humans. All had survived, mother, father, mother, children, and from their five dynasties, had descended increasingly contaminated bloodlines and swelling lists of vendettas. Hey, Kaihan. This is called the Scarlet Gospels, a book written by uh, Clive Barker, the famous uh, Hellraiser guy, Hellraiser author. Of the eight members of the present regime, only three were in the Bastion tonight. Their enthusiastic general, Augustine Pentathia, Pentathia had an unrepentant lover of war and its rapturous cru cruelties set in the high back chair where the regime's noticeably absent authority, Katha Nyakapo, was usually seated. The others in the room, Ezekiel Suth and Josephine Liti, were not able to conceal their agitation. If Nia Kapo were here, Suth began, we would have this situation under control by now. It is under control, General Pantathia replied. He wore his long hair long, as did all the members of the regime. Though Pantathia's hair was gray and his purple-black brow ritually scarred with three downward cuts, each the thickness of a finger. They had been coaxed with repeated cutting to stand proud of his forehead. The marks gave him an expression of perpetual fury. Fury, though his voice was measured and calm. Oh, you know why you had to ask? Because I don't have the right freaking channel on. So you can see the uh, actual freaking thing. Here we go. There. <laughs> see, I knew I forgot something. So let's go. The marks gave him an expression of perpetual fury, though his voice was measured and calm. How do you figure? Suits asked. I'd like to hear your theory as well, Lithi offered. 
She was standing against the far wall of the chamber, her waist-long white hair unkempt. Her eyes closed as her detached gaze searched the fog outside. Below the bastion looking for the felon. I was just so excited to get into the book, I forgot to totally get into that channel. He murdered all but a few of his order. We should have him arrested and executed. A trial would be better, Sufo opined. He was by several centuries the oldest in the room, though he did much to conceal the fact. His hair dyed in unnatural, intense black. His brows plucked, his skin white where it wasn't rouged. Something showy to distract the populace. Distract them from what? said Pentathea. The fact that we're losing control, Ithi said. Isn't it time we were honest? If not now, when? Ithi is right, General, Sooth said. If we made a real example of the Cenobite, a long public trial followed by some form of crucifixion, we'd have back the love of our citizens and our enemies at the gates, he said, interrupting Sooth's soliloquy. And he has a follower. Another Cenobite? Another Cenobite? Pentatheus asked. I thought you said they were all dead. I said most, but it's not a Cenobite. It's a human woman. Then Hell's most wanted villain is at our doorstep. Ezekiel, do you have anything prepared for this fiend? Pentathea wanted to know. As it happens, I do, General. I have devised a metal blanket which has a lining that will be filled with ice. We'll burn him at the stake. Eventually, of course, the ice will melt and the fire will have its way. But I've repeated the experiments 11 times now using men, women, and even infants, just to be certain my calculations are consistent. And Ezekiel Sooth allowed himself a barely perceptible smile. He'll be fully conscious while the skin is burned off him as his muscles fry in their own juices. Indeed, we'll judiciously arrange the fuel for the fire so that he isn't smothered by the smoke, which is too easy a death. Instead, he'll be cremated systematically but I discovered that this method draws the victim up into a pugilistic pose. So I'll bind him with chains to prevent the posture. It'll oblige his bones to break while they cook inside his flesh. You've been thinking about this quite a lot, Pentathea said with a hint of distaste. One has to dream, General. Until a few minutes ago, you didn't even know we had the bastard at the gates. No, but it was only a matter of time before somebody challenged us, wasn't it? Have faith. The Cenobite won't carry the day. He is one, and we are fewer than we should be, he said. Hasn't anybody wondered why our glorious leader isn't here today? Absent without explanation on the very day that a killing fog comes out of the wastes, and that thing out there with his face of nails comes to pay a visit. What are you accusing him of? the general inquired. Who, Niakapo or the Cenobite? Bugger the Cenobite, I'm speaking of our leader, Katha Nyakapau. I am accusing him of being dead, most likely, General. And Quelat, and probably Hithmonio, Hithmonio, too. All of them missing without explanation on this of all days. Of course they're dead. The creature outside made it his business to murder as many in power as he could. And then what? Penetheus said. Aren't you the general here? Lithia he asked. All you're doing is sitting atop the leader's throne and asking inane questions. This should be your field of expertise. It is, Pentathea said, rising from his post. I have led whole armies against the divine horde and seen them beaten back. I once had a place at Lucifer's table. I was Hell's general when it was still a mud pit. And I know exactly what's going to happen next. That demon is going to kill us. When he's torn the meat from our bones, he will continue his mad quest wherever it may lead him. In short, we had better depart. No, not just from the chamber, but from hell itself, if we value our lives at all. As the members of the council discussed their future, the Cenobite, who had been the subject of their conversation, caused the three triple-bolted triple iron gates that sealed the bastion off from the city streets to be thrown open, their locks shattering like ice. At the same time, the group of weary travelers, led by Harry Moore, entered the city by the easternmost entrance, Jenker's Gate. There were watchtowers to the left and right of the compound, but the towers were deserted and the right-hand gate opened. Jenker's Gate offered them the least impressive view of the city they had thus far seen. It lay close to the river, the same one they had crossed on a solid iron bridge, and therefore was occupied chiefly by those whose businesses, business was with the river. 
the same one. Da, 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 da. Oh, here we go. Demons who labored to keep alive the damned souls who'd been buried up to their chins in adjacent mudflats, powerless to protect themselves from the birds that stalked the grounds, looking for worms and leeches, and finding easier nourishment among the screaming bulbs, eating away their faces peck by peck, eyes, tongue, noses, and nerves, until the short-beaked birds could get no further and left the remaining rations to the infernal varieties of heron and ibis, who were better equipped at piercing the empty sockets to reach the fatty and plentiful brain tissue. But none of these creatures, damned or damning, were now found on the street that led from the gate. There were plenty. There was plenty of blood, however, to mark their recent presences, the cobbles shiny in the air filled with the fat doxy flies that wove around as though intoxicated. <coughs> they weren't the only life forms feasting here. On the walls, where there were numerous bursts of blood, creatures that possessed the shape and gait of lobsters had emerged from between the bricks, and had gathered around these stains, their busy little mouth parts greedily scooping up the bits of blood. Is this what the fog did to people? Kaz said. I just want to know where they went, Dale said. Was this not in the dream? No, Dale said, his voice fa falling below a whisper. And I don't like that one bit. Lana was doing her best to keep the blood-drunk flies from landing on her, but they seemed immune to her flailing and happily settled in her hair and on her face. Harry had wandered ahead of everyone, staring, st staring on at the street ahead toward the larger and more architecturally ambitious buildings that were visible beyond the modest two-story dwellings of the neighborhood through which they traveled. Demore, Dale whispered. What? I think we should stick together. The observation had barely left his mouth when a figure appeared from the alleyway behind him and caught hold of Lana, who was perfectly able to deal with her attacker, a blow to the throat, a kick to his lower belly, and as he bent double an uppercut to his chin and the attacker was down, sprawled on the cobbles. The fuck is that? Harry said, approaching the unconscious demon. I don't want to alarm you, Harold, but that is a demon, Kaz said. But what's wrong with him? Harry said. For the first time, Harry got a close look at what the, what the fog had wrought. The creature was a demon, Harry saw, well-fed and well-muscled, dressed only in baggy trousers held up by the ornately decorated belts that younger demons seemed to favor, <coughs> his prehensile tail emerging from a small slit in the back. Around his neck were several lengths of leather or cord, each of which bore some keepsake. In all of these regards, he resembled most of the demons belonging to the minor orders whom Harry had encountered in the past. But Harry saw that the fog had worked a, a change in this demon, and it was not pretty. At the corners of his mouth and eyes, in the folds of his arms, or between his fingers, wherever, in short, the fog had touched him, it had apparently planted a seed, germinated not by producing some infernal vegetation, but by taking its cue from the spot in which it had been sown and growing a new life form that was ordained by the place of origin. Thus, the seed lodged between the demon's fingers had brought forth a crop of new fingers, all of which possessed their own beckoning life. And the seed beside the demon's mouth had created new mouths, all of which gaped many-toothed within his cheek and his neck. All these anomalies were humbled, however, by the work a seed lodged in his left eye had done, multiplying the number of eyeballs so that from his brow to his cheek were a bunch of wet, lidless eyes, their yellowish corneas dissected up, down, and sideways. The demon reached out suddenly and caught hold of Kaz's ankle, his many-jointed fingers easily locking around it. Despite the demon's agony, or perhaps because of it, the grip was vice-like. In his efforts to free himself, Kaz lost his balance and fell back and landed hard on the bloody cobbles. Before anyone had time to react, the maddened demon crawled atop Kaz's body, his motion disturbing the flies that had come to rest on his anatomy and creating a ragged, shifting cloud around them both. The demon was a big-bellied creature, and his weight was easily sufficient to keep Kaz pinned to the ground. Jesus fuck! Someone help me! Kaz yelled. Where's that damn machete? Harry said. I've got it. Give it to me. Lana tossed the machete to Harry. No sooner had he caught it than the demon, perhaps dimly sensing that he was about to be opposed, reached out for Harry with one of his many-toed feet and caught hold of his throat. New gnarled toes sprouting as he tightened his grip and cut off Harry's oxygen. As the demon dug his nails deep into the flesh around Harry's windpipe, Harry took a swipe at the demon and bar buried the blade in the creature's thigh. Shock and pain made the thing loosen its throat hold on Harry, and Harry pulled away. The seeds continued to offer proof of their vicinity, 
The demon before him was still transforming. The bunches of eyes were swelling, the mouth spreading down the creature's neck and out of his chest. They were all by some elaborate reconfiguring of the demon's internal anatomy, possessed of health enough to loose a chorus of screams and pleas. Harry intended to grant the thing the only mercy he had on hand. Kaz, now, he said, as though they had done this a thousand times before. Kaz instantly pushed the demon away from his body at the same time Harry swung the machete through a 180 degree arc. The blow sliced through a third of the demon's neck before it stuck into the creature's vertebrae. Harry worked the blade free, hot blood gushing from the massive wound and into Kaz's open mouth. Ah, fuck, said Kaz, through liquid coughs. Harry swung at the demon's head a second time, hoping for mercy's sake to deliver the coup de grace. But there was too much crazed life in the creature, and he moved away as Harry swung the blade. This time the machete cut through the, bur the burgeoning bunch of black and yellow eyes and sank deep into the demon's skull. Thirty eyeballs or more dropped from the cluster and rolled around Harry's feet. The demon's mouth, where the demon's mouths were letting out a single sound now, a long, sustained funer funereal lament. Harry took it as a sign that the creature was readying himself for death, and the thought put power into his third swing. It went, more by accident than intention, exactly where the second blow had gone and took off the top of the enemy's head. The demon lurched, and the severed crown slid off and landed on Kaz's chest, several eyes popping from the pressure as it struck. The rest of the pitiful thing sagged for a moment or two in Kaz's arms, then kneeled over dead. It took the combined strength of Lana, Harry, and Dale, pushing from above, and Kaz pushing from below, to roll the corpse away, but when they finally did, Kaz pushed himself up into a sitting position, where he paused to wipe some of the blood that had spewed on him and then got to his feet. Thank you, he said to Harry. I thought that was it, man. <coughs> Nobody's dying on this trip, Harry said. Especially at the hand of some underling. Understood? Lana? Dale? You follow? We're going to get through this. Lana was staring down at the corpse of the demon Harry had brought down. Do they all look like this? she asked. Too many eyes? All those mouths? No, said Harry. That's what I was saying before the bastard sprang back to life. I think that's what the fog did. This isn't normal. Not by a long shot. I think we left normal back in New York, Lana said. Honey, we left normal long before that, Dale said. Demore nodded in terse agreement. <coughs> we probably got a nice little window to move freely through the city, though, so I suggest we go while the going is still good. Everyone agreed, and they proceeded up the shallow incline that led from Jonker's Gate, continuing through the city at a steady pace. They were being watched, Harry knew, every step of the way. At first he only felt it, that tingling sigil on the back of his neck, the ever-trustworthy UI. But soon there were more obvious signs, doors that had been opened and slit, were closed sharply when his gaze chanced their way. Crude curtains or drapes were dra dropped back into place, and now... And then he heard voices from inside the houses, cries and arguments, and sometimes what might have been demonic prayers offered up in the hope of some fiendish salvation. At every intersection they crossed, Harry glimpsed figures skipping out of sight into doorways or alleys. A few were even spying on them from the rooftops, risking whatever was left of their lives as they stalked before earthly life forms. Suddenly Harry's tattoos went wild. He said nothing, but out of reflex his hand went to the place on his neck where the tattoo sang its warning cry. Ah, Christ, Kaz said. I know what that means. What what means, Dale said, his voice barely audible. Shit, Harry said. My tattoos. Kaz, I forget you can read me like a book. I wrote that book, Kaz said. Yeah, well, I'm being warned to proceed with caution. Harold, we're in hell. Caution is a fucking given. I put that fucking tattoo on you, and the way your hand shot to that bit of ink tells me that caution doesn't even come close. Fine. You want the hard sell? We're not alone, and I think we're fucked. Happy now? Harry said, walking on. Very, Kaz replied. As if on cue, from somewhere near the sound of feet on stone were heard. From another direction... Oh, okay. From another direction, a short cry loosed. Seemingly in response, Harry and his friends heard an unholy, deafening din arising from every direction. The loose sound hadn't been a cry at all. It was a summons, and it was answered in the multitudes. A horde of terrible voices suddenly punctuated the air with mad house noises, shrieks, and sobbing and joyless laughter, 
all varying imitations of the previous sound, so that within the space of less than a minute, the city was no longer silent, but filled completely with this cacophony, its source steadily closing on the intersection where Harry and his friends now stood. Dun dun dun! Chapter 16 Listen, said the hell priest. What in God's name is that? Norma said. They had stumbled together upon the bastion's 91 steps, which led them to the massive front door of the regime's sanctuary. It was there now that the priest attempted to gain entrance. I used to live in Los Angeles, Norma said. Off a winding road called Cold Heart Canyon. At night, sometimes you'd hear the yipping of a coyote, and a whole chorus of them joining in as they came to share the kill. That's what that sounds like. A bunch of damn coyotes, howling with the happiness because they're about to eat. That's exactly what it is. Oh, Christ, Norma said. Harry. He should consider himself lucky if he dies here and now, said the priest, raising one hand and laying his palm flat against the door. The regime's assassins are afraid. I can hear them weeping on the other side of this door. She could too now that she paid closer attention. It was more than simple tears that escaped them. There was terror in their cries. They've never seen the void, the the Cenobite said, raising his voice so they could hear him. They are like children now, waiting for me to come inside and show them the way. A voice rose above the sobs, its owner doing his best to sound sure of his sanity. Go back from where you came from, demon. I heard you have troubles, friend, said the hell priest. The denials at this threshold were laid by Lucifer himself. You'll never gain access. Then I shall waste no more of your time. So saying, the demon waved his hand over the door and muttered an incantation, incantation so soft. Norma wasn't quite sure he heard. she sure heard anything at all. Whatever right the priest had issued, it had worked its magic, but quick. Oh, oh no, oh damnation, said the same voice behind the door. Wait. Yes, the hell priest, the hell priest asked. Don't go. As you have said, you are safe within your walls. You have no need of me. We are under siege. There are things in here with us. Terrible things. It's too dark to see. Help us, please. Hallucinations. You don't really think that'll work, do you? Oh, that's not him. That's not the Cenobite. That's Norma. Hallucinations. You don't really think that'll work, do you? They're demons. They know. Norma said. Stop talking to him, a second voice said from within. He's playing tricks on us. And then, you're stupid for coming here, Cenobite. The regime has plans for you. See? Norma said, her question answered. Wait, the priest said to her. Be quiet, said the first voice. Let him in. He has powers. He can help us. Yes, let him in, said another, his ascent taken up by half a dozen others. Turn off the denials, Kaft, said the first guard. Let the priest in. It's a trick, you damn fool, the dissenter broke in. Enough, the first guard said. There was a sound of ragged motion and then the thump of a body being thrown against the door. No, don't. The dissenter never finished the sentence. In place of words come the sound of a violent impact, and then that of his dying body sliding down the door and hitting the floor. Norma's mouth hung open in shock. I don't believe it, she said. And our journey has not yet even begun, the hell priest said. Masada, came the voice of the first guard. Get this carcass out of the way while I turn off the denials. Priest, are you still there? I am, said the Cenobite. Step away from the threshold and be careful. There was a resonant click, and the door swung wide. A large yellow and orange demon greeted him at speed. The soldier was easily twice the priest's height and dressed in a golden armor. He ushered the Cenobite into the chamber, gesturing frantically all the while. The hell priest, followed by Norma, entered the small antechamber occupied by a dozen soldiers, all clad in the same war vestments. They're everywhere! These monsters! The guard pleaded. You must help! The Cenobite made a tiny nod and said, I know. I came for the regime. They are in danger. Where is their chamber? The soldier pointed toward a staircase that branched off into dozens of differing directions. I will lead you. The tower is a vertical labyrinth. You will go mad before you find your way to the second door. This was the first chamber. Theirs is the sixth. We will fight this scourge together, brother. 
These fiends will not carry the day. The remaining chambers are each 1,000 soldiers strong. Then I have much work to do, the hell priest said. He then reached into his robe and took out its folds, Le Marchand configuration. One of these. And handed it to the guard. Here, he said. What is that? The soldier inquired, taking, taking it in his hand. A weapon. I have several. He took out another three and passed them to the demon, who then passed them to the other soldiers. What do they do? Open them, the hell priest said. Harry might have taken some comfort at the belief that all but the soul was a human illusion, but there was nothing in his present circumstance that looked illusory. The street at the intersection where he, Kaz, Dale, and Lana stood was a nightmare with no foreseeable escape. Each of the humans stared down a different street, but all saw the same unwelcome sight, the monstrously transformed citizens of the unholy city coming at them. The terrible multiplicities had sprung up from the places where the fog seeds had lodged themselves, rendering each beast a horror unto itself. All had stripped themselves completely naked, and to add injury to insult, their already transformed anatomies brought forth strange blood-sopped blossoms, and from those blossoms further generations of seeds were now sprouting. They had all too clear a vision of the seeds of their fecund work. I think I'm saying that right. F-E-C-U-N-D? Fecund? Fecund? New victims convulsed as their outgrowth swelled and burst, spitting juices in all directions. The flesh they had wetted instantly, casting out nets of ripe red veins that were moments later nurturing the creation of new multiplicities. The second generation's growth was more confident than the first and more ambitious, the third and fourth exponential. The forms that they brought into being weren't simply siblings of the anatomy where they'd landed, they were aberrant, aberrant and fantasized. And again, as with their, pro their predecessors, the urgent need to be naked, to expose every niche and fold to seeding so that the, in the space of a minute or two, the number of appendages had tripled, the newly infested still shrieking as wave upon wave of agony overtook them. Strangest of all among the new recruits to this unspeakable regiment were the demonic children. Freed from the constraints of hearth and home, their bodies, for all apparent vulnerability, more eager to, even than those of their parents to reinvent themselves. They wanted to be new species, the seeding provided, providing the perfect reason to unleash every heretical thought that they could make flesh. Even as their parents reached the limits of their disorder, their children were overtaking them, giving their bodies to the grand experiment with an abandon their elders had tried in their flesh too long to control. Hence the boy with thirty arms or more reaching out from the roots in his back, or the adolescent girl whose sex had split her all the way up to her breastbone, her wet wings undulating as it opened to invite the world to do its worst, or the infant even seated into its mother's arms and riding the saddles of her milk-fed breasts, its hand a blistered ball swelled to three times or more its natural size so that it eclipsed its mother's face completely. As for its limbs, they had quadrupled in number and become, became in the process little more than bone and sinew, their joints defying nature and turned backwards to embrace the mother's body like the many jointed legs of a spider. There was nothing of pity here, nor needless to say of love, simply the unrelenting hurt and horror of tomorrow's hell being born on the bed of glass and nails where yesterday's hell was in the long, messy process of dying. And the occupants of new hell had blocked the streets from one side to the other. There was nothing to be done, nowhere to go. The circle of the enemy was around them, complete. What's the plan, Harold? Uh, die? Harry said. No, Dale said, more in defiance than fright. Fuck this, and he pressed on toward easily the most crowded of the four directions. Dale, get back here, Harry shouted. Dale didn't listen. And then there were three, said Lana. Dale stopped when he reached the first swarm of damned and distorted. Oh, just go away, he said. So saying, he raised his cane and jabbed its pointed tip into the belly of a demon boy. The young demon shrieked, beating a hasty backward retreat on many of his feet. There was a mark, Harry saw, a small black circle that was growing exponentially and quickly becoming a mess of black lightning bolts shooting through the villain's veins. The demon lost his balance and went sprawling down amongst his comrades. A female demon charged toward Dale. He was waiting for her, cane in hand. The silver tip pricked a cluster of sapling breasts and her dozen eyes bulged from their loose hanging sockets. She unleashed a howl and her skin too quickly became a maze of poisoned flesh. Harry watched everything and was beginning to understand. 
The flesh from the demon boy's wound had begun to fold back upon itself like blossoming flower petals, exposing the shiny wet muscle beneath. His skin was retreating with great precision, the square growing, its symmetry spoiled only by the blood that was spilling over as the patch of exposed flesh grew steadily larger. The same process was happening on the female demon's breasts, where some kind of miracle had left its mark, but the speed which, at which the square was growing had increased fivefold or more, her multitude of teats all but stripped of skin, her blood-matted chest hanging on the drapes of her breastplate. Dale jabbed at another demon, and another. Each victim was seized in agony as the place where they had been pierced opened and unmade itself. What the fuck is going on? Lana asked. Dale, you're a goddamn genius, Harry said. I could kiss you. Promises, promises, Dale said, impaling another demon. Harry tightened his grip on the machete and headed toward his own besieged horde. New plan, Harry said. Grab whatever weapons you have and start cutting. You sure about this? Lana asked. Harry looked back at her and smirked. Dead sure. Probably not the best choice of words, but saying all she had to say, Lana pulled out two knives, gripped them, wrist crossed with elbows out, and walked straight at the oncoming swarm. I guess that means me too, Kaz said. He pulled out his weapon and followed suit. Kaz took a swing, slicing the seventh forearm of an enormous granddaddy of a demon. The beast clutched at the wound with four of his hands, but the gauze was not enough to stanch the wound. From underneath the cluster of fingers, the demon's flesh <coughs> unfolded itself devouring muscle and bone from top to multi-layered bottom. Harry and his group of harrowers hacked and slashed their way through bulbous, the bulbous throng, needing only one wound to stop each adversary. There were none among the demons who were granted immunity. They all went down, young and old alike falling, their bodies racked with spasms, reaching with desperate desperation to catch hold of the killing moat, but never far enough to seize the enemy at its work. In a short time, there were dying demons lying everywhere, a dozen deep in some places, sprawled over one another, a mass of bodies in the process of self-skinning, pools of blood rising between them all. Harry glanced back at Dale, Lana, and Kaz. That wasn't so bad, he said. <coughs> Kaz, panting, stared at his comrades expectantly. Does anybody want to explain to the big dumb queen what the hell just happened? You forgot to mention gorgeous, Dale said. Kaz looked down at Dale and smiled coyly. Ah, where was I? There we go. As he brushed the severed nipple off his shoulder. I don't give a shit how it worked, Lena said. All I need to know is that we're still breathing. Clearly, Harry said, something was causing those poor bastards to sprout multiple pieces of anatomy. Clearly, said Lana. Whatever was making that happen, it didn't seem to care whether it multiplied appendages or wounds. Its mission was simply to divide and conquer. The second we opened a hole in those things, the working did the rest for us. Got it, Lana said. Good enough for me. <clears throat> Dale, uh, did you know that would happen? Kaz asked, stepping over a small mountain of bleeding cunts. I hadn't the foggiest, Dale replied. I just knew we had to find Norma and that God wouldn't allow us to be stopped now. Do me a favor, Dale, she said. Yes, dear. I know this one went well, but next time you put my life on the line because of what you think God will allow, leave me out of it. Spoil sport, Dale said. <clears throat> Let's move, Harry said by way of reply. I can't wade through all this, Lana said. It's just a little blood, Harry remarked, catching hold of Lana's arm. Come on. Muttering something underneath her breath, Lana went with him while Kaz and Dale brought up the rear. Together they stumbled over the mass of bodies, only to find that many of them still had some measure of life in them the skinning process as yet incomplete. That was something, Kaz said, watching the continual undoing beneath his soles. I've seen stranger things, Harry said. You say that about everything, Lana said. Not everything. Oh yeah? Like what? Harry pointed past her, toward the end of the city. Lana turned. The last shreds of fog had cleared away, and for the first time they could see all the way down the street to the impossibly tall black marble building that stood at its end. Yeah, that's hard to top, she said. Without anyone uttering another word, they began walking. The wind had escalated considerably, raising clouds of dirt and litter, and when it gusted with particular vehemence, vehemence, opening and closing doors along the street. A crudely constricted chimney was toppled from a roof half a block closer to the regime's headquarters. 
the sliding bricks bringing down slates and eaves with them. The wind brought clouds too, gray shreds like dirty clothes torn between the roofs and the ever-grinding stone. Some of the clouds even pressed down into the streets and raced along with the wind at the level of the eaves. The harrowers put their heads down against the bluster and moved on toward the unguarded gates of the monolithic structure without further challenge. How thoughtful, Harry said. They left the front door open for us. Very considerate, Lana said. Here's the plan, Harry continued, never breaking stride. Me and Dale will deal with any demons we find. Kaz and Lana, if Norma's in there, you grab her and get her out of there at all costs. Leave us behind if you have to. Any objections? Of course, the objections were innumerable, but not one was uttered aloud, and without protestation, they entered the tower. What the fuck is this? Lana asked. They had entered the tower, not knowing what to expect, but anticipating at least the semblance of a fight. What they got, however, was a first-hand look at the aftermath of a massacre. And a recent one at that, judging by the steam that rose from the still-fluttering corpses. The bodies that blocked the passage just inside the front door were already the feeding and breeding place of hell's green gold doxy flies, the smallest of which were ten times the size of their humble earthling equivalent, and their offspring were correspondingly eager. Some of these bodies were already pulses of masses, pulsing masses of larval life, devouring what they'd been born into with monstrous appetite. As Harry listened to the play of his friend's footfalls, he surveyed the blood-drenched canvas before his eyes. He knew this was the work of the Cenobite. These, Harry guessed, were only the beginnings of the visions to which the Hell Priest had requested he bear witness. He was happy he'd declined the offer, not that he'd entertained the notion. But the demon they were chasing was powerful. That much was certain. The problem, however, was that he was far more powerful than Harry had ever wanted to admit. Harry was standing ankle-deep in the organs of many large demonic soldiers, warrior demons, clearly, who, likes, who likely spent the majority of their lives preparing for battle, and they had been felled in the blink of an eye. Harry shuddered. Jackpot, Kaz said, bringing Harry back from his thoughts. Broken from his trance, Harry looked up and saw his friend collecting weapons from the dead soldiers. Kaz had used his time wisely and had already acquired a considerable collection of belts, bristling with knives, all ornately decorated, but clearly more than showpieces. Hallelujah, Nell sang. We're trading up. Good thinking, Lana said. She drew out a knife that sprouted a second, third, and fourth blade, intersecting the first so as to create an eight-pointed star. I'll take this one. Great, said Harry, giving the chamber a twice-over. Let's take what we need and get the fuck out of here. After making their selections from the vast array of infernal weaponry, they advanced toward the first set of stairs, and though each pair of eyes stare started on the same step, none landed upon the same location. Uh, said Kaz. My thoughts exactly, said Lana. You think he'd go easy on us for once, Dale said. Oh, he has, Harry offered. Everyone followed Harry's gaze, and there they saw a small stream of blood trickling down the face of one of the stone steps. Hell's breadcrumbs, Harry said. You know, most people wouldn't follow the blood trail. Not us, though. Jesus Christ. Look on the bright side, said Kaz. If there are bears in hell, they won't come after you first. That barely makes sense. Barely? Kaz said, grinning. Shut up, said Lana. Harry had already begun to climb the stairs, far too intent on his mission to allay his fears with humor. Lens wave, how's it going? His sobriety quickly caught on, and Lana and Kaz silenced themselves, following Harry up through the vertical labyrinth. They passed through the chamber after chamber. Oh, they passed through chamber after chamber without error, always following the beginning of the blood trail at the end of another, for there were many bodies in the various chambers of the bastion through which they passed. Some looked as though they turned on one another. Others, like they'd simply been casually murdered by someone passing by. Hey, lens wave. Hello, hello, do you, I see you. Hello, hello, how you doing? There were a few who were still faintly alive, but they were all too far gone to answer any questions that might have been put to them. On Harry and his followers, pressed until they reached the sixth and final chamber. What the hell? On Harry and his followers pressed until they reached the sixth and final chamber of, at the top of the Black Tower. I think that might be a typo. Like every door they'd reached up to this point, this too was wide open. Though the chamber Harry and company walked into was vastly different from anything they had seen until now. The area was chaotic. There was no doubt of that. But there was no blood to wade through, as there had been in the previous chambers. And there had 
clearly been a struggle here, but there were no corpses. Pinhead had failed in destroying the regime, and by the looks of the place, he hadn't been very happy about it. Once more into the proverbial breach, then, Dale said. When in Rome, Harry said as he entered the chamber. Harry stared across the wreckage in the room, his eyes fixated on a large archway, seemingly the only other means of entry or exit found in the room, at the opposite end of the chamber. Inside this archway, he saw, was a void. No bricks or mortar, but for that matter, no light, objects, colors of any kind. All sense of place was lost here. In the world above, a sight such as this one would have invited madness. In this realm, however, it was yet another one of Hell's tiresome mind games. Harry found it surprising how soon his senses had numbed to the madness of this place. Do as the demonic do, Dale said, finishing Harry's thoughts for him. That's how expression goes, right? Dale walked through the debris, spinning his cane as he moved on. The fuck, man, Cass said. What does this thing want? Like, what's the end game, you know? No, Harry said, drawing closer to the archway of nothingness. I don't know. His eyes were fixated on the sight, or lack thereof, and as he approached, he realized that the archway wasn't as barren as it had appeared to be. The nothingness was an illusion, and the closer Harry drew, the more his n this nullity before him was beginning to form a flat, monochromatic image. Perhaps the magic of this thing depended upon the nearness of a warm body, or perhaps it simply begged scrutiny in order for it to work. Whatever the case, Harry was now within a stride or two of its location, and he could now plainly see a flickering image of one of the streets he and his harrowers had passed through on their way to the tower. He recognized the location because it wasn't easy to miss the remains of the recently slain and infected damned who were still lying there. Can someone tell me what I'm looking at? Harry said. Is this magic or technology? What? Where? Dale said, turning to look in Harry's direction. What you got there, Harold? Kes said. Harry opened his mouth as if to say something, but no words escaped his lips. Dale, Lana, and Kaz joined Harry at the threshold of the archway. Silently, they all stood staring at the image before them. Finally, Lana spoke. Looks like... looks kind of like a television. Like a really shitty closed-circuit image. Harry squinted. He hadn't seen much television in his lifetime, but from what he remembered, it was a very different experience. Can I, uh, borrow your cane? Kaz said to Dale. You can hold my cane as long as you like, Dale said, handing Kaz his cane with a playful glance. Kaz took the cane, trying to conceal his smile, and quickly turned toward the flickering image. Lifting the cane, he extended his arm, careful not to get too close, and made to press the ivory tip onto the surface of the screen. Be careful, Harry said. Harold, I'm fine, Kaz replied, and then pressed the tip into the archway. The image rippled where the tip touched the surface, like concentric waves disturbing a serene, translucent lake. Ah, said Harry, it's not either or, it's both technology and magic. Looks that way, Lana said. I've never seen anything like it, but that's got to be some kind of liquid display screen held up right with some kind of working. Kaz, continuing the experiment, moved the cane across the liquid, causing the image before them to turn like the pages of the book. The view of the streets folded and gave way to a new and entirely unfamiliar vista of the world in which they were outsiders. What the fuck? Don't burn a, don't burst the brain cell air, old Kaz said. It's like a security camera. Shit. Kaz lost the grip of the cane and it fell into the archway. My lucky cane, Dale shouted, though no one was to know. He had a collection of over 200 lucky canes, all identical, all with the same opulent design, all, according to Dale, equally necessary. Quickly, Kaz dropped to his haunches and reached his hand out toward the rippling void. I wouldn't do that, Harry said. Cane's one thing, but... Relax, my ink ain't saying shit. And I'm assuming yours isn't either, Harry said nothing. Kaz nodded. That's what I thought. And so saying, he thrust his hand into the liquid void and grabbed for the cane. Please be careful, Dale said. Cass turned to Dale and smiled, wordlessly retrieving the cane from the void and bringing it back into the chamber. I got a notion, Harry said. Cass, let me try something. Mind? Cass asked Dale. He can touch my cane too, Dale said. I'm honored, Harry said as Cass handed him the cane. Harry inserted the cane into the liquid and flickered it quickly. Revealing image upon image, faster and faster Harry flicked it, and in different directions, up, down, left, right, revealing different locations and images based on each of the differing movements. I'll be, said Dale. It's like the walls of eyes. Yeah, and on in each direction, Harry said. 
moving the cane at a slower, more deliberate pace. Represents an axis. Looks like we can go left, right, forward, backward. In and out, Dale said. Kaz chuckled. Good question, Harry said, and he pressed the cane deeper into the image on the screen. A vast mountain range of craggy, jagged rocks, and the picture zoomed in for a closer look. That would be a yes, Harry said, continuing to play with the mechanism. I don't say this often, but I'm impressed. Yep, Kaz said. These fuckers definitely got the gizmos. Wait, what was that? Go back, fuck! What did you see? I said. The other way, Kaz instructed. There, stop! Harry brought the image around again and saw on the screen the Hell Priest, accompanied by several regime soldiers, each of them at least seven feet tall. Resting comfortably on the shoulders of the tallest soldier, the shoulders of the tallest soldier was Norma. Oh, fuck me dead, Harry said. Harry and his Howard stood there, looking into the void at the image of Norma surrounded by a small army of fiends. There you are, Mama, said Kays. We're coming for you. You bet your fucking ass we are, said Harry. What is that? Dale asked. Oh, God, said Lana. Look at the other soldier in its hands. Is that a severed head, said Harry. I've seen enough of them to know. Harry pushed the cane deeper into the liquid image. The picture of the figures on screen grew larger. I still don't know what we're seeing or how we're seeing it, but it's great to see Norma again, Harry said. Harry gently eased the cane in further, ensuring he'd not lose sight of the hell priest and his brigade. Suddenly, the priest and his entourage stopped dead in their tracks. The demon who carried the severed head lifted it up, and the priest slowly and cautiously turned back and began walking toward them. What are they doing? No fucking clue, Lana said. This thing doesn't have audio, does it? If it does, I haven't figured out where the mute button is yet. Harry and his harrowers watched as the hell priest reached for the severed head and lifted it toward his face, putting the mouth to his ears. You gotta be fucking kidding, said Kaz. Afraid not, old friend, he said, Harry said, turning to Kaz. That fucking head is still talking. Yeah, said Lana, and I have a pretty good idea what it said. And all too soon, so did the rest of the harrowers. On Lana's prompting, they had returned their gazes to the screen and saw that the hell priest had now lowered the head and was looking out at Harry and his companion, companions as though seeing perfectly clearly the lens through which he was being watched. That's fucking spooky, said Kaz. Right, Harry said, his voice tremulous. There goes the element of surprise. Norma had done her best to create a rough map in her mind, tracing the journey she'd taken in the company of the Cenobite, the few soldiers he had conscript conscripted from among the survivors of the massacre at the Bastion, and the still-living severed head of a military general named Pentantia, one of Hell's highest-ranked officials, whom the Cenobite had beheaded without hesitation or effort. And though the chance of ever making the return journey seemed remoter by the mile, she still held on to the tender hope that she might find a way back. They had left the bastion with one of the soldiers carrying Norma on his back. She still had enough powers of persuasion to get her mount, whose name was Nachi, to quietly describe to her the territory they journeyed over once they were beyond the bastion. It seemed to be a promising arrangement from the start, with Nachi using a soldier's unadorned vocabulary to describe the landscape through which they traveled, but his simple eloquence quickly faltered once they got beyond the last of Piratha's streets and ventured out into the wasteland itself. There was nothing for him to describe except emptiness. Are we not on a road of some kind? Norm asked. Nachi lowered his voice to keep his reply from reaching the hell priest's ears. The only road we're following is the one the Lord Tempter's head. If he loses his way, we're all dead. That's not very comforting, said Norma. The silence the silence the conversation for a long well, this silenced the conversation for a long time. When Nachi looked to, took up the talking again, it was because finally there was a change in the view. Now, however, what he was seeing wasn't so easy to describe, and he fumbled for words. There were huge pieces of wreckage, he said, strewn across the desert, the remains of machines the likes of which he had never seen before. To his soldier's eye, it looked as though a war had been fought here. Though he freely admitted he could see no killing purpose to which these vast toppled devices could have been put. And if there were demons who might have died during the war, he had no way of knowing, since there was not so much as a single bone underfoot. Do demons have ghosts? Norma asked. Of course, there will always be those that won't let go of who they were. 
If this had been a battlefield... Oh, okay. If this had been a battlefield, there'd be ghosts wandering around. Perhaps they are. Oh, oh. Okay, she says, if this had been a battlefield, there'd be ghosts wandering around. He says, perhaps they are. She said, I, I'd know if I were there. If there were, Norma replied. Ghosts and I have a way of crossing paths, and I don't sense them here. Not one. So if this was a battlefield, it was one where all the dead went to a contented rest. That would be a first for me. Then I have no more ideas, the soldier said. Despite Norma's encouragement, the descriptions grew steadily sparser. But as she was riding on his shoulders, her arms wrapped around his neck, it wasn't hard for Norma to read the signals that were rising off the soldier's body. His skin was getting clammier, his pulse quickening, his breath too. He was afraid. Norma knew better than impugn his masculinity by attempting to reassure him, or impugn his masculinity. His masculinity. He just held tight and kept her peace. She just held up and kept her peace. The wind rose for a time, its gusts so strong that they would have thrown her over if she'd been on her own. And then, just as the rising velocity of the wind started to cause Nachi to stagger, the storm died away completely. There was no slow diminishing of the force. One moment they were being struck by gust upon gust. The next, the wind seemed to have died away completely. What happened? Norma whispered to Nachi. The sound of her own voice gave her some answer to the mystery. The wind hadn't suddenly stopped blowing. They had simply stepped out of it into what sounded, to judge by the noise of their feet on pebbles and her words, like some kind of passageway, the walls of which corrupted the sounds, stretching them or slicing them into slivers. The wasteland's gone, he said. The stories are true. It's all folding up around us, and we're going to get folded up in it. He started to turn around, his breath coming in panicky gasps. Don't you dare, Norma said, catching hold of one of his ears and twisting it as hard as she could. It was the kind of thing an irritated parent might do to a troublesome child, and perhaps for that reason it gained the soldier's attention. He stopped in mid-turn. That hurts. Good, it's supposed to. Now listen to me. I don't know you from a warm hole and a cold corpse, but there's been enough bloodshed already without adding your body to the heap. Wherever he's taking us, he knows what he's doing. If it were possible, I would be humbled, the hell priest remarked from quite a distance ahead. It was obvious, it, obvious he'd heard every word Norma and the soldier had shared. You're right, of course. I haven't come this far to deliver us into oblivion. I have such sights to show you. Soon you will have answers to questions you have never even dared to ask. The words cut through Nachi's panic. His heartbeat ebbed, his skin dried, and he picked up his stride once more. And it was just as the hell priest had promised. After thirty or forty yards, the passageway and its confines opened up. What do you see? Norma asked. There was a long pause. Finally, Nachi said, It's so big, I'm not sure. Set her down, the hell priest said. Nachi did as instructed. The pebbles were extremely uncomfortable beneath Norma's bony behind. But within a few minutes of sitting down, there was the sound of running feet off to her right, and shouts of what surely was, was adoration from those who were approaching. Nachi had walked off, leaving Norma to interpret what had happened next by the sound alone, which she was used to doing. She guessed that perhaps a dozen or so creatures had come along the beach to pay their respects to the Hell Priest. She heard several dropping down onto the pebbles, whether kneeling or lying, she couldn't tell, to demonstrate their reverence. Their shouts subdued now to sibilant whispers. Only one voice rose above the worshipful mutterings, that of an aged female who addressed the Hell Priest in a language Norma had no knowledge of. Ooh, okay. Avosita. Lensle, Lazle Matazu. Ethesiatir, the hell priest replied. Sumudamo Sot Ositha, the woman said, and then apparently addressing the others. Batu, Batu. Pick up your. Oh, okay. Pick up your baggage, soldier, the hell priest said. The Azil are prepared for our arrival. They have readied our vessels. As soon as Nachi hoisted Norma onto his back, he said, I'll be glad to leave this place. Then more, then more quietly, glad to leave these freaks. Norma waited until the trek along the beach was underway, and she heard the sound of feet on the pebbles to cover her questions before she dared to ask her question. What do you mean by freaks? They're inbred, Nachi said. Can't you smell them? They're disgusting. When this is over, I'm going to bring a squad out here and clean this filth up. But they're demons like you, aren't they? 
not like me. They are misshapen. Heads too big, bodies too small, all of them naked. It's an insult to their heritage. It makes me sick. They must be stomped out. What heritage? The Azil were the first generation of angels after the fall. The sons and daughters of those who had been cast down with our Lord Lucifer. Theirs were the hands that built Piratha. And then when it was finished and our Lord Lucifer pronounced it good, they went with him to their own land, which he had made for them as reward for their labors. And having gone into their secret country, they were never seen again. Now I know why. And where is Lucifer? Does he have his own secret country? He's gone many, many generations. As for where he is now, it isn't my place to ask, nor is it my right to know. The Lord of Lords is with us every moment and in every place. Even now? In every moment, in every place, the soldier replied. Now, unless you want to walk from here, let this subject sleep. Norma and the soldier continued in silence, walking along the beach as the Azil led the Hell Priest and his entourage to their boats. The Azil had started chanting now, the chant's rhythmic power, building phrase upon phrase, changed with obsessive devotion. The chant turned Norma's thoughts to pulp. She couldn't hold two notions together. They need you to go to the boat, Norma, Nachi said. Can I go with her? He asked somebody and was given the answer he wanted. I'll sit in front of you. Nachi lifted Norma up off his shoulders and gently deposited her on her wooden seat. She reached out to the left and right of her, running her fingers over the car carved beams. The boat did not feel particularly stable. Even though there were in the they were in the shallows, it rolled alarmingly when someone climbed aboard. Where is he? Oh, where is he? She asked Nachi. In the first boat, he replied. They're carved. They carved him a kind of throne. How many boats are there? Norma asked. Three, answered, answered Nochi, all carved with angels' wings running the length of each side of each boat, every bob and vein of every feather perfectly carved. I never saw anything so beautiful in my life. Truly, we are blessed to bear witness to such events. Funny, said Norma. I've never been happier to be blind. The old demon woman who had first addressed them spoke once again, if I can remember her voice. When you go... No. When you go, I start big chanting to conceal any noise you make from Quarto. I, I think that was her voice. The name brought barely audible rumblings from the Azil who were in the boats, despite little, desperate little prayers, Norma guessed, to keep Quoto away, whatever it was. All of you, the demon went on. Not to say a word until you get to the last place, Quarto, here as well. The observation was echoed in whispers by the entire assembly. Quoto, here as well. Quoto, here as well. Quoto, here as well. The old, the old woman said, Be wise, be silent, be safe. Will he staying here and making like a noise that will drive Quoto deeper? The boats were pushed off from the shore, their hulls scraping on stones for a few seconds before they floated free. Then those who had the oars, one of whom was Nachi, began to paddle, and if the strength of the wind behind against Norma's face was anything to judge by, they were skimming through the water at a tremendous pace. Norma could hear the bow of the boat behind them cutting the water, and very occasionally the sound of one of the oars striking one of the waves from the boat in front, but otherwise the first portion of the journey, which took perhaps half an hour, went without incident. Soon after, however, Norma, Norma felt a sudden drop in temperature, and her skin, be her skin began to crawl with a goose flesh. She could feel it pressing against her face and chilling her lungs when she drew next drew breath. Despite this, the boats continued on their expeditious paths through the water, sometimes coming out of a patch of mist for a few teasing moments of warmth, only to plunge back into the bitter air before Norma could even stop her teeth from chattering. The noise she was making was loud enough for one of her fellow passengers to pass forward a piece of canvas that Nachi placed between her teeth to silence her. Finally, the mist began to thin a little, and then as the boats came to shore, suddenly it was gone. That's when Nachi spoke. Oh, demonation, said Nachi. It's beautiful. What is, said Norma, leaning closer to Nachi, but he gave no reply. Tell me, Norma said. What? What do you see? In the span of his life, which had been to date far longer than any human life, the hell priest had witnessed a great deal that would have cracked lesser minds wide open like fumbled eggs. He once visited a continent 
in a remote dimension that had been that had contained a single species of model shell creatures the size of roadkill mongrels their only food one another or if pressed to it their excremental remains truly the hell priest was no stranger to abhorrent to the abhorrent and yet now that he was in the place where he'd longed to be for so many years the place that he'd conjured in his mind's eye waking mind's eye waking dream upon waking dream why, he wondered, did he find himself nostalgic for the presence of those corrupted beasts who had only earned his contempt in earlier times? As soon as he begged the question, he knew the answer. Though there wasn't a living soul in hell, or out of it for that matter, to whom he would have confessed the truth, which was simply this, now that he was finally here in the unholy of unholies, where he had ached for too long to be, he was afraid. He had good reason. His boat had come ashore, and fixing his eyes only on the structure, he went to it like a moth to flame. And now he stood, buried in the oppressive shadow of an edifice so secret, so vast, so complex that there was nothing in hell or on earth, even in those most guarded, guarded of chambers in the Vatican, which had been built by men of such genius the chambers defied the laws of physics and were vastly larger on the inside than on the out that had any hope of comparison with the place where the hell priest now stood. The island upon which the structure had been built was called Yapora, Yariziak, literally the last of all possibilities, and the name was no lie. The hell priest was finally here, at the end of his journey, with so many betrayals and bloodlettings marking his path, and he actually found himself assailed with doubts. Suppose all his hopes of revelation were confounded, Suppose the Arch Fiend's majesty had not left any mark on this place for the Cenobite to draw power and understanding from. The sole reason the priest, hell priest had come here was to stand in the last testament to Lucifer's genius. He had expected to feel Lucifer's presence in him, filling up the void in him and in so doing showing him the secret shape of his soul, but as it stood he felt nothing. He had read somewhere that the makers of the Shachai Cathedral the masons and the car carvers of the great facade had not chiseled their names onto the finished work as an act of humility for the creator, in whose name the cathedral had been raised. Was it possible, he wondered now, that Lucifer had done something similar, actively erasing the echoes of his presence in the name of a higher power? He was suddenly agonizingly aware of the nails that had been hammered into his skull, their points pressing into the clotted jelly of his brain. He had always understood that this portion of his anatomy, being nerveless, could not give him pain. But he felt pain now, bleak, meaningless, stupefying pain. This is not right, he said. There was no echo of off the walls of the edifice. They had consumed his words just as they had had his hope. He felt something stirring in his belly, then rising through his tormented body, growing in force as it ascended. He had cultivated a distance from his own despair over the years, but it met him at this place and would never again be put out of his sight. He only repeated to himself, This is not right. All right. We are going to stop this for here for now. We are, ladies and gentlemen, we are up to page 513. This is a huge novel. So um, what I'm going to try to do after this stream is over is just clip the entire reading portion into a nice, uh, you know, little clip clip thingy. So anybody who missed the first two or three sessions where I'm reading this can at least try to catch up. So we are pausing on chapter 20, and we will pick this back up. I'm really, really into this novel. I don't know. I'm supposed to be using Saturday to play music and video games, but I'm really, really into this novel, so I will consider possibility of just going jumping right back into the novel on Saturday but definitely on Sunday if not Saturday we'll pick it back up so friendos I am fucking out of here um that Tante that D4 and G3 on the internets on Twitter for updates um in the announcements channel on my discord um if you're a discord user and uh we will pick this back up later have a good one guys
not, Jacques, remember your lessons. A summoned demon is yours to command. Unless you stand in hell's way. Summons the magic, commands the magic. You are Angelique. He who summons the magic, commands the magic. up against the wall. You heard him. Back it up. Don't make us put some pain on you. Pain? How dare you use that word? He's got pins in his head. What you think of as pain is only a shadow. Pain has a face. Allow me to show it to you. Gentlemen. 